And I want to use Jesus as an example of dealing with uh, our emotions and specifically today, emotional intelligence, because he is the example, like he is the ultimate example when it comes to dealing with this kind of stuff. So verse 36 says, in Matthew 26, verse 36 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. That's uh, James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38 says, Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for trusting us in this space. Uh, we ask for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding. Um, help us to be more intelligent as we deal with our emotions and our feelings. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So you have to imagine yourself in this scene uh, because Christ has literally the weight of, his wor of the world on his shoulders. He is now beginning to experience the burden of our sins and the ultimate price of our sins. And just in case some of you are uncertain about what that burden is, the burdens of sin, the cost of sin is not to be crucified. The cost of sin is to be forever separated from God. That is the ultimate price of sin. This is what Paul says in Thessalonians. This is what we read often in Scripture, uh, not maybe stated overtly, but we definitely see it in narrative form, that when we are cut off from God or separated from God, we wither away. These are Jesus' examples in the parable of the, of the vine and the branches, the parable of the wheat and the tares. It is this idea that one day, those who choose not to remain with Christ, remain connected, would be like a branch that is cut off, withers away, and dies. And so Jesus, when he decided to take the ultimate price for sin, it wasn't to be tortured and crucified. It wasn't to be spit upon, although that was part of his passion experience. But the ultimate price of sin was to, was, was to be as a sinner who no longer wanted to be connected to God. He bore that responsibility. He bore that weight. And this is what he's experiencing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, some could argue that Christ would probably experience a lot of these emotions, even if it wasn't him bearing the weight of the world. I mean, just the fear of death itself can be overwhelming. Uh, the thought of how you die, right? Some of us think about that. You know, you were, some would say, Drowning would be the worst way to die. Some would say that being burned would be the worst way to die. All of us have our own thing that we are really scared about when it comes to death. To be crucified is enough to overwhelm anyone with tremendous fear and sorrow. But Jesus was experiencing a weight that went beyond the fear of just simply dying. It was feeling the sense of his father's presence leaving him. Now, just so you know, the father never left his son. The father never abandoned his son. But sin, the full brunt of sin, distorts our perspective. In other words, when God came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they had sinned, God did not change the way that he dealt with them. God did not change the way he talked to them. God didn't change anything about his character. What had changed was Adam and Eve. What had changed them was sin. So now the sound of God coming to them in the cool of the day was no longer exciting. It was now fearsome. And they ran and they hid. Sin distorts the picture of God. Sin distorts the sound of God. So in this moment, it's not that the father abandoned his son. It's that Jesus is now experiencing life with sin undiluted. This is the cup that the Bible talks about in Revelation, the cup, of, the, the cup of God's fury, the cup of God's wrath. And God's wrath is not him losing his temper. The wrath of God is him allowing us to be fully and forever cut off from him. In other words, it's God simply respecting our choice to no longer remain. 
And so Jesus is now filling this. And listen to what he says to his disciples. It says, as he is experiencing this, this sorrowfulness, right? He says, as he began to be sorrowful and troubled, he then communicates pretty intelligently what he's experiencing with his disciples. He tells them, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Think about this for a second. Jesus is expressing to his disciples that his sorrow is so intense that he believes he is dying. Sorrowful to the point of death. In fact, I, I would say that if Christ had not received encouragement by an angel that was dispatched, we don't read about it here in, in Matthew, but if Christ did not receive encouragement from an angel, he very likely would never have made it out of the Garden of Gethsemane alive. That is the weight of sin. That's how intense it is. And that is what ultimately broke the heart of Jesus. Not the nails, not the scourging, not the crown of thorns, not all the beatings, right? Not even the hanging there suspended between heaven and earth. It was the awful sense of separation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Christ communicates to his disciples what he is experiencing. Now, um, according to Daniel Goleman, who is an American psychologist, he really made emotional intelligence famous. And uh, he popularized it. And, and he has five key elements to emotional intelligence. And the first one is self-awareness. This is what we often lack when we experience emotions. We lack self-awareness. Let me give you an example. There are, there are people that become irritated because they are hungry. Have you ever been around those kind of people? We call them hangry, right? Right, Snickers has popularized this phenomenon by saying you're not yourself when you are what? Hungry. But how many times when people are hangry do they actually acknowledge that's what they're experiencing? In fact, some of us don't even know that's what the person is actually dealing with because they'll start to talk about all the other things that are so wrong in their life, including you. And after they've eaten, you know what they say? Oh, you know, I'm really sorry. I was just hungry. That's what this was all about? You were hungry, but you were pulling everything off the shelf telling me what a terrible person I am. And so when you around people who are not self-aware, right, they're not emotionally aware, they often will blame others for what they are experiencing. You've been around those kind of folks, right? I am feeling insecure. And because I'm feeling insecure, it must be something that you're doing to make me feel insecure. So I am going to tell you how you need to do better to make me feel better. And it's very interesting that in this moment, Jesus doesn't seem to blame anyone for his sorrow. In this moment, Christ could have easily said, because of you knuckleheads, I'm going through all of this. I was perfectly fine in heaven, just chilling, being who I am. But because of your stubbornness, because of your brokenness, because of your selfishness, I now have to bear your sins. So thanks. I'm really sad because of you. That's not what Jesus says. He never puts his sorrow on them. He just tells them, guys, I am so sorrowful right now that I feel like I am dying. And so all I want from you is just to watch me. How different our relationships would be if we had this type of approach. I'm having a really bad day right now. I'm not even sure exactly what it is, but I just, I woke up in such a mood. It could have been a dream that I had or a nightmare that I had. It could be because when I saw myself in the mirror, I didn't like who I saw. But I'm not about to put that on you. I just want to let you know, I just feel sad today. Family, when we are self-aware and we're able to communicate clearly with people what we are feeling, it gives others an opportunity to actually organically meet those needs. Let me give you an example. I often tell couples, 
you need to learn how to communicate what you are feeling. And you know what the, the, the immediate response is? I feel like this person it never does anything that I like, never does anything that I want. I feel they're no good. I feel, oh, no, 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 no. That's not a feeling. That's a judgment. Stop. Tell me what you're feeling. Well, I feel he never listens. Whoa, whoa, whoa. that's still not a feeling. Tell me what you're feeling. What is it that you're experiencing? I feel abandoned. Oh, okay. Let's talk about that. He abandoned me. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait. No, no, no. Don't say that. That's a judgment. You may feel abandonment without anyone abandoning you. You know that, right? You can feel abandonment without anyone even abandoning you. It could be something, again, that you're connecting with from your childhood. And it has nothing to do with the person in front of you in that moment. And so that's why it's so important for us to be self-aware and to communicate what we are actually experiencing. What are we feeling? And Jesus does this without putting the blame on anyone in his circle. And he had reason to blame. He could say, Peter, I don't even want you to come near me right now because I know what you're going to do in about an hour. He doesn't say that. He says, Peter, man, just, just, just watch with me, bro. Just watch with me. Being emotionally aware, being self-aware is so critical in our relationships. And it's so critical to your emotional health because it allows you to, one, be honest and transparent, and it also allows you to be vulnerable with people. And instead of putting people on the defensive by saying, you left me, you abandoned me, you're no good, you don't pay attention, or all this other kind of stuff, it gives them an opportunity to not put that energy in being defensive, but put that energy in being a help. It's much different when you go to somebody and you say, and I hurt my arm. Oh, what happened to your arm? Can I help? Versus, you broke my arm. What do you mean? What did I do? You did it. So the Bible continues on. Christ says, my spirit is sorrowful even to the point of death. And it says in verse 39 that going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he began to pray. He begins to pray, my, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus tells his disciples that his spirit is sorrowful unto death, and his way of dealing with this overwhelming sorrow is not to put the responsibility on the disciples, but he actually goes a distance by himself and talks to the father. So Daniel, Daniel Goldman says that the, the second thing about being emotionally intelligent is to be a self-regulator. Self-regulation is really important. So when we are experiencing our emotions and sometimes even our overwhelming emotions, it is important for us to learn how to self-regulate. Often, many of us manage our, 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 our spiked emotions with uh, uh, what we call secondary emotions like anger, rage. Some do it through substances. That's how they handle it. I just need more coffee. I need alcohol. I need something to kind of bring me down. I need, I need weed. I need something to kind of just regulate what I'm experiencing and feeling. Some of us will regulate in other ways. We'll go to websites, and that's how we're going to manage what we're thinking and feeling. And, and this is so important how Jesus chooses to self-regulate. There's a number of ways that Christ could have responded to this sorrow. If he's feeling bad and sorrowful about being far from his father, you know, he could just say, Dad, I'm coming home right now. I just need to see you face to face right now. I'm coming home. He could have done it that way. He could have been able to, he could have used his powers to manipulate the situation. But Jesus chooses, he chooses to one, first acknowledge what he's feeling, and he chooses to self-regulate by communing with his father. Many of us don't take the time to pause and to reflect, and to pray, and to meditate on God's word. We don't take the time to commune with the designer, the creator of peace, and happiness, and joy. We don't choose to plug in with the God who loves us, adores us, and wants to be in relationship with us. In this moment, as Jesus is feeling far from his father, he still makes the choice to communicate with his father. This is so important because this communication doesn't come from a place of feelings and emotions. 
It comes from a place of faith. In other words, God, my Father, I can't feel your presence right now. I don't feel close to you right now. However, in faith, I know that you are there. Are you seeing that? I don't feel it right now, but I know that you're there. And many of us will not make decisions in faith without having the feelings there. I don't feel God is close. I don't feel God is there for me, so he must not be there. And so I don't even want to pray to him because I can't feel him right now. But Jesus gives us an example not to be slaves to our feelings and emotions in the moment. Learning how to self-regulate through faith. Learning how to self-regulate by using wisdom. Learning how to self-regulate. What I want to say is by trusting in what is true. In other words, I can stand in front of the mirror and not like who I see that morning. But that doesn't mean who I see that morning is disgusting. The person I see that morning is no good. I may feel that way in the moment because I don't like the way that my wrinkles look or I don't like the way that that outfit is fitting me or whatever it may be. But just because that's the way I feel in the moment, that is not the truth of the moment. Are you understanding that? And that is why we must rely, as we talked about two sermons ago, we must rely on the truth in these situations. I may not feel like I'm worth anything in the moment, but that doesn't mean that I am actually worthless, right? And so we must trust what is absolutely true. Jesus went through the same experience in the, in, uh, in the wilderness. Remember when he was there for 40 days and 40 nights without any food, no cell phone service? Remember that? And then the, his adversary came and tempted him and says, if you are the son of God, because you don't look like the son of God right now, you look like a mess, a hot mess, Jesus. So if you are the son of God, you should at least be able to feed yourself, at least turn these rocks into some burritos. And what did Christ trust? Did he trust the word of, of, of his adversary? Did he trust in his own power? He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the father. In other words, I am going to trust what my father says is true. Now, what was true is what his father said about him 40 days prior. And what did his father say about him 40 days prior? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So when the serpent, when Satan, when the dragon himself shows up and says, you don't look like a son of God to me, Christ is like, well, I may not look like it. I may not feel like it, but I know I am because of what my father said 40 days prior. Amen. So we must rely on what is actually true. I'm not saying that what you're feeling, what you're feeling is not your reality in the moment. What I'm saying is we must learn how to look past our feelings and emotions in the moment and trust what is actually true. If you believe that same. So the Bible says, as he continues on, that he, Christ is self-regulating, not by having his friends hold his hand, not by his friends uh, 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 affirming him in this moment. Yes, they're there at a distance, but Christ is learning how to self, not learning, but is self-regulating in this moment. And it's with, with, with his connection with his father in faith. So the Bible says that, uh, uh, he says, but not my will be done, but your will be done. So verse 40 says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Now, his request was very clear. Watch with me. My spirit is sorrowful unto death. So watch with me. And what is his response? What is his response? The disciples' response is to do nothing. <laughs> they actually fall asleep. Real quick here, are you guys hearing static? Is it? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch mic. I, I, I can't hear it from where I am, so I apologize. Test one, two. Test one, two. Any static? No static? <laughs> all right, just stop me in the middle of the sermon. Just text me. That's what my aunt texts me, all in caps, exclamation mark, static. <laughs> like, is that a new way of saying amen? <laughs> all right. 
now you know I can read my text message as well. I'm preaching. All right, so how's that? Is that better? Is that okay? Yeah. All right, okay. It's, a, it's a slightly a little bit hot, Andrew, for me. I feel like a, it's going to be a, 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 so me either take it out of the monitor or perfect. Okay, good. Let's get into it. Um, so the disciples, the disciples, we'll have to cut and edit this. <laughs> so it comes, it's seamless. So the disciples, their response is to be asleep, just to be asleep. They're not there for, for Jesus. And what do you think Christ's reaction should be in this situation? Right? Very intense. He's, he's burdensome, he, 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 he's overwhelmed, a lot of stuff, he's trying to self-regulate, all this stuff, he's being emotionally aware, you know, the intelligence is there, and yet his disciples let him down, and what should his response be? He says, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, the spirit is willing, but the body is what? Weak. Weak. I am blown away by this response. I really am. The question is a sincere question. It's not, God, it's not Christ, you know, being passive aggressive, which we read that into the text because that's who we are. Couldn't you stay up for at least an hour? Like, you know, like we think that's what Christ's attitude is. It's a sincere question. Can, 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 you, guys, can you guys not stay up with me just for a little bit? I, I, I really need you in this place. And here's the thing. I don't want you guys to fall into temptation. I need you to be praying as well. So it's not even just about Jesus. Christ in this moment is also looking out for his disciples and their well-being. I don't want you to fall into temptation. Peter, specifically, I'm talking to you, bro. I know what I said was going to happen this night, but I am still praying that you don't fall into that temptation. I'm still praying that you're strong enough to get through it. So he's saying, I want you to do this, but then watch the acknowledgement. And this is, this is the part that's so beautiful here. He says, I get it. I get it. The spirit is what? Willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus acknowledging, acknowledging the challenge it is to stay awake in this moment. Most of us do not have what, again, Daniel Goleman says is one of the other uh, five key elements, and that is empathy. Most of us don't know how to have empathy, but emotional intelligence should always give us empathy. When you're an emotionally aware and intelligent person, you are an empathetic person. It allows you to put yourself in other people's shoes and say, I'm pretty sure you didn't wake up this morning and you wanted to be Lex Luthor or the Joker and be sinister and make my life miserable. I know that you also are going through your own stuff. I know that you have your own baggage. I know you have your own fears. I know you have your own insecurities. And so I'm asking you to help me out, but I'm also aware what gets in the way of you helping me out. Are you hearing that? So I'm not going to vilify you in this moment. I'm not going to make it seem like you're the worst friends ever. You're the worst spouse. You're the worst kids. You're the worst parents. I'm not going to do that, right? That is comic bookish, and we should never react in that way. These absolutes, you never hear from me. You never do anything right. It's silly, and it's childish, and I love that Christ is mature enough in this moment, in his great need, when he should feel the freedom to be a little bit selfish right now. I'm about to do all this for you. Can y'all give me just a little bit? But no, he says, I get it. You really don't even know what's about to happen. I know. I know I've warned you and I've told you, but I know that in your faith right now, you still don't see it. I know the spirit is willing. I know that you love me. I know that you care about me, but your flesh is so weak right now that you can't see past this moment. You can't see really what's at stake right now. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. When you become an emotionally intelligent person, you have to be an empathetic person. It happens naturally. I don't believe any emotionally intelligent person cannot be empathetic. I think if you're an emotionally intelligent person, being em empathetic is a natural reaction, a natural response, a natural inclination. It is who we are. Emotionally intelligent people are empathetic people. You show me an empathetic person, I will show you an emotionally intelligent person. So if you don't find yourself being empathetic with people, not knowing how to see and put yourself in other people's shoes, know that you need to become more emotionally aware, more emotionally in tuned. Because when you are, you are an empath empathetic person. So let's continue on here. So the Bible says that Jesus then returned. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 
let's, let's go back. So he says, uh, the spirit is weak. Verse 42 says, he went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. So I love the fact that after Christ is disappointed by his disciples' reaction to his, his, uh, his situation, that he still continues to self-regulate. He still continues to go back to the Father. He's not hearing anything from his dad. His dad's not speaking a word to him right now. But it doesn't stop Jesus from being true on his end. And this is something, again, another lesson that we must learn And that is that even when the circumstances aren't improving around us, it does not give us the freedom or the right to to behave or to act out because things around us aren't working out in our favor. Continue to be true to yourself. Continue to do what is right and what is healthy. You may have all these temptations to say, you know what? I am going to eat my feelings now. I am. I've done my best, and no one around me seems to care, so I'm going to eat my feelings. I'm going to act out in in, in this way. I'm going to say some things I may regret. No, continue to be true to yourself. Be true to the Word of God. Be true to what God is calling you to be, because that is the only way to be emotionally healthy. It is the only way to navigate through these difficult Gethsemane moments. So Jesus continues to connect with his Father, even though he's not hearing anything from them, and even though he's not getting any support from his disciples. Are you guys seeing that? He's continuing to be true, continuing to be faithful, continuing to say, my, my, not my will, but your will be done. So verse 43 says, he came back again and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. What is Jesus' response? I can't believe. <clears throat> After I told you, you're going to do this again, but watch this. He says their eyes were heavy, so he left them and went away once more and prayed. This time he says nothing to them. This often takes far more restraint. When we've communicated with our partner, communicated with our loved one, communicated with our family member what we need, and they've heard from our own lips what we need, and they still don't do as we ask, many of us believe that is now our license to go off on everybody. But Jesus realizes in this moment, his disciples are not up for the task. That's it. They're not up for the task. They're not going to encourage me. They're not going to be motivators. They're they're, they're not. They're, they're, They're not. They're not. I was clear on my end. They received what I said, but this is where they are, and I accept it. This is something that many of us, we do not take what I like to call social cues. We do not read the room. And Jesus is perfect in this situation. This is, this is another key element, and it is social skills. It's being, it's being socially aware. Have you been around people who are just not socially aware? Like they can be in a room and they can't even tell they're not liked. They can't even tell they're, they can't even tell they're annoying people. They can't tell that their sense of humor isn't really funny. They're going to continue to be abrasive. They're going to continue to kind of just say things that are inappropriate, not be aware of the audience. Have you been on people like that? They just don't, they don't, they just don't pick up on the cues. When you're an emotionally intelligent person, you pick up on cues. You become very sensitive to the room. You can feel when it's appropriate, when to say something, when not to say something. I am very grateful. I am very grateful for those who in certain situations, even though they know the truth, know when it's not time to like give a thesis on the state of the dead when their neighbor says, I lost my mom, I'm just so sad, but I know she's in heaven right now looking on me. Well, wait a second, let me, let me take you to Ecclesiastes. <laughs> let me tell you what Jesus said in John 11 about those who die. I I love, I love people who know the truth, who I know deep down are know-it-alls, but know that it is not the time to share everything, to wait for the right opportunity to share truth. And for those of you who think, no, if you know the truth, it is your responsibility to share it in that moment. Even Jesus said, I have so much more to tell you, but you couldn't handle it right now. It ain't the right time to share it with you right now. But the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit that I give you He'll, he'll, he'll clue you in. 
He'll let you know when it's appropriate, when it's time. That is why there are some lessons the disciples learn in the book of Acts that they did not learn in the ministry of Jesus because it wasn't the right time for them. There was certain prejudice that Peter had to overcome in the book of Acts that he did not overcome when he was a follower of Christ because Christ knew Peter wasn't ready for this lesson, but one day Peter would be ready for this lesson and he would share that lesson with him through a dream. Somebody say amen. God realizes that we're on a journey and there's a process. And when you are emotionally intelligent, when you are emotionally aware, you are socially aware. Your social skills improve as well. You can feel the room. You can know when it's time to tell somebody, I want to pray for you. And when to say, just know you're in my thoughts. And when it's appropriate to say you're in my thoughts and in my prayers. People who are emotionally aware have great social skills. So if you find people who are kind of avoiding you, people who don't want to really talk to you about what's going on in their life because they kind of see you as a very judgmental person, if you find that people are actually going left when they see you, just ask yourself, what is it about me? What am I giving off that... That, that is a repellent instead of an attractant. And I love that Jesus did not take this moment to tell his disciples about who they were. He saw them asleep, and he said, all right, I'm on my own. Because that's where they are right now. I'm on my own, and I'll do this alone. And he does. There will be times, family, there will be burdens that you carry alone. There will be times that there'll be people in your life that won't be encouraging, they're not gonna be motivating, and they're not for their own reason. Sometimes it's their jealousy, sometimes it's their insecurity. Sometimes they see you growing and improving and that makes them feel smaller and they don't like that. So they're gonna to try to remind you of your past and remind you who they think that, that you really are, all that kind of stuff. When you see that, just know that's their own baggage, that's their own emotional immaturity, and that's not you, right? That's not the truth. You have to be able to see yourself. So Christ knew just because the disciples were asleep didn't mean he was unloved, he didn't matter, his mission was all a failure. No, Christ knew that he still had a purpose and he still had a mission. He had great social skills, great social awareness. And this leads me to our last point. We talked about self-awareness, self-regulation. We talked about empathy and having social awareness, having good social skills. Here's the last one, and that is being emotionally intelligent means you are very aware of what your motivations are. You're very clear on what motivates you in life. And this is critical. There are people that will feed the homeless because they just want the accolades of looking like they're a good person who cares about people. But it's not because they actually care about people, they actually care just how people think about them caring about people. Are you listening? And then there are those who feed the homeless because they care about people's needs. And then they still have this other sliver that maybe is about self as well, and they have to be aware and, and toggle between those competing motivations and figure out which one will rule their life, which one do they want to embrace, which one they want to feed. And I've been in those places before. I, if you notice, I never tell stories, this is going to sound like I'm giving myself a pat on the back, but I, I never tell stories about myself where I am the hero. I, I stay away from that because being a pastor and being up front already comes with a certain amount of adulation, people praising you, people thinking you're good. And so I don't ever want to feed into any of that that like, perpetuates this belief that pastors or spiritual leaders or any kind of CEO, that we're superior, we're so much above everyone else. I have to steer clear from that kind of stuff. And it almost sounds like I'm patting myself on the back and I'm a very humble person. I'm just telling you, I know what my own struggles can be and I have to be hyper aware of it. So, so if you find yourself again, feeding a person who is homeless, don't go home and announce it. Don't go home and tell your friends, oh, yeah, I'm sorry I was late, but there was somebody in need, and I just had to help them out. No, don't feed that monster. Don't feed the monster that pumps self up. Do it because someone's in need, and let it be between you and God. That's what the Bible says. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing it. And the Lord who sees you doing things in secret will reward you. That is our motivation. It should always be pure. And Christ needed to understand his motivation. Now watch this. So he goes back again. He goes back again, and he prays the same things. He hears nothing from the, his father, so he knows, he knows that he is going to do what his father's will is. Are you still sleeping in verse 45? 
and resting. <laughs> Are you still sleeping and resting? He's not being passive aggressive. It sounds like it, right? Y'all, y'all still sleeping? He says, look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. It's so interesting at this moment, Christ, again, is not taking the opportunity to, to, to heap on them, again, all this guilt and shame. Because he says, are you still sleeping? He says, and resting, right? He understands that they're tired, right? Are you, are you resting? Are you, you got your strength? Are you guys, you guys good? This is still going on? All right, well, listen, you have to rise now. It's time to get up because the enemy is here. I'm being betrayed into the hands of sinners, So the question is, why does Jesus ultimately, in this moment in Gethsemane, why does he ultimately decide to go through with it? His spirit is sorrowful unto death. He's overwhelmed, right? He's going through all these things. His friends around him don't seem to care. There's all these reasons for him to kind of exit the freeway and just get out of Dodge, leave earth, be done with this. Dad, I tried. You know I tried. But these people, right? All these reasons. So what ultimately makes Jesus do what he does? Is it based on principle? Because people always talk about love as a principle, and I will argue, it's probably another message, that love is principled, but it's also emotional as well. I think they're both equally as intense. I think there are times that it needs to be principled because our emotions are, are out of, you know, are haywire, and we don't understand it, or we're not being intelligent with our emotions. But there are times it is deeply emotional, and it may not make logical sense to some people. But I'm asking you the question right now, why does Jesus ultimately go forward from Gethsemane to Calvary? Why does he ultimately choose to give his life as a ransom with everything seemingly against him? What is his motivation? Someone will say love. Some will say love. But interesting enough, he loved us before he got to Gethsemane. He was already in love with us. The reason why he chose to be incarnated was because he loved us. The reason why he spent 33 years of his life on earth was because he loved us. So why in this moment is he shaking? Why in this moment is he wavering? What's going on, Jesus? I thought you loved us. So shouldn't he walk in Gethsemane with like, I got this. I love them that much. I got this. But that's not what seems to be the great motivation. I know, I know this is going to sound sacrilegious. I'm so glad that I'm about to end the sermon right now so you don't have to live with this tension through the whole entire sermon because sometimes I'll let you live with that tension for 30 minutes. But it almost seems like it's not love is not enough in this moment. It almost feels like love is not enough in this moment. Now, of course, you'll say, but pastor, he goes through with it, so clearly love overcame all of the obstacles. Yes, but I am going to submit to you that there was an emotion that Jesus clung to that got him through this moment and Calvary. I am going to submit to you that because of Jesus' emotional intelligence— because of how aware he was, because he understood who he was, because of how he self-regulated, he was so clear about this one motivation that I believe gave him the extra umph that he needed. You want to know what it is? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We'll end on this. Hebrews chapter 12. You're going to say, but... Pastor, love was enough. I'm not not saying love wasn't. I'm just saying in this moment, Jesus was a little wobbly. Understandably so. But the author of Hebrews tells us what pushed him over the edge, what got him to the finish line. And I love this. Let's just start with verse 1. Verse 1. You guys there? You guys there? Hebrews, it's New Testament. Come on now. A lot of pages still turning. All right, we're there. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. I like this. This is, this is like what you would see at a finish line of a race, a marathon, a sprint. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Oh, Paul is painting the imagery so perfectly. It is a race. It is a marathon. The crowd is cheering. Everybody is chanting. Jesus is running this race. He says in verse 2, let us fix our eyes on who? Jesus, the author and what? Finisher of our faith or perfecter of our faith. For, he says, who for the joy set before him, he what? Endured the cross. 
the what's that before him? Joy. Not love? No. Not perseverance? No. What was set before him? Joy. joy. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. Joy? What joy could have been set before Jesus? So when we were preparing for Nathan's birth, we went to all these classes. I've shared this with you before. Iris wanted no epidural medication, and there are enough women out there that thought the same way, and I can't believe it, but they exist. <laughs> and there was a whole class of them. And these classes were all focused on how to get through the pain and endure until the end. And they tried to help us men be empathetic, so they put on stuff for us to watch, which I can't watch that stuff. Because when I watch it, I think, God, none of this is beautiful. This must all be sin. But they gave us ice that we had to hold in our hand, and we had to hold it as long as we could, even though the ice was causing so much pain. And, I, I, and they said, but keep holding on. And of course, <laughs> I know you ladies are like, oh, that's not even close <laughs> to what it feels like. But what they kept telling the women in this class is that when you feel you can't go any further and you feel like the pain is too much, all you need to tell yourself is this, my baby is that much closer. My baby is that much closer. I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I remember we were in the home and and Iris was beginning to get the contractions and so on and so forth. And that started early in the morning and then around 7 o'clock at night. She said, I think it's close. I think it's close. Call the midwives. Call the midwives. I called the midwives. I said, you know, Iris is saying it's close, saying it's close. And they said, oh, it's not close. I know. She's saying it's close. She said, it's not close. I said, how do you know? You're not here. They said, because she's too chatty. <laughs> I said, oh, Okay. But I said, come anyways. I want you to come. Measure me. Let me know. And they came and they measured. And she wasn't anywhere near close. And I'll never forget this. She was moaning and in pain. And once she found out she wasn't even close, she just stopped it all. All right. <laughs> if this ain't even close, I ain't going to waste any energy complaining about this pain if it's about to get a lot worse. And I'll never forget, she got into this zone where I could not talk to her, and she could not talk it either. And she would just be rocking back and forth. And she was feeling all this stuff. I know this might make you feel a certain way, but I, I, want you, I want you to understand that there is something that a mother has to latch onto. And at this moment, it's not principle. It's joy. The joy set before them. And doesn't Paul say this? Doesn't Paul say this, that, oh, a mother, once she holds her baby, she forgets about the pain that she went through? We know she does because she does it again. <laughs> Some of y'all have like four kids, and I'm like, did you learn your lesson the first time? <laughs> but the joy set before them, and it just can't help the joy. So Jesus had joy set before him, and you want to know what that joy was? It was you. It was me. He thought of us. He thought of his sleeping disciples. And he said, I'll keep going. Because he looked at that moment when we one day will be gathered around the sea of glass. No more sin, no more death, no more pain. It was joy that fueled Jesus to endure the cross. Family, when we are emotionally intelligent people, when we through the Holy Spirit allow ourselves to be vulnerable and transparent, to be honest with our failures, and to open ourselves up to improve and to grow, to be sanctified, 
I believe we will be able to tap into the purest of emotions. And some of you will be able to work through your marital issues. Not because, well, you know, God hates divorce. It'll be because of the joy set before you. Some of you will be able to deal with that situation that you're struggling right now with your children, with your son, with your daughter. And it won't be because, well, the Bible says it'll be because of the joy set before you that you continue to endure. I want you to become emotionally intelligent people so that God is able to tap into the purest of emotions that motivate us to finish the race. Amen? Not finishing the race because if we don't, God will kill us. If we don't, we'll get in trouble. That's not a good motivator. It's not a healthy motivation. But for the joy set before you. There's someone here today that you just want to become more emotionally intelligent. I know you're, I know, listen, don't, again, I'm not trying to be psychology of today. I'm not, that's not, listen, God's the one that created the mind. God is the one that created emotions. All I'm simply saying, let's look at scripture and look at moments where people are emotionally healthy and intelligent people. That's it. Just because that's the name that psychologists give it, whatever. The reality is, is God is calling us to be whole and healthy people. And as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we're about that, mind, body, and soul, amen? And so this series has really been about making sure that the mind is right, that our that a way in which we uh, experience our emotions, the way that we handle our emotions, the way we react to them is in a healthy way so that we can persevere, that we can finish the race the way that Jesus did, amen? And there's someone here today that wants to become a more emotionally intelligent person. You want God to make it so clear to you the things that you need to change and grow so that you can be healthier, you can be more effective, you can be clear about your motivations moving forward. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray, a very specific prayer. You, you, you know who you are. Some of you have allowed your emotions to take control and run your life, and, and you want to be better at this. You want to be exactly the way that Christ was in this story in Gethsemane. Amen. I see you there standing there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us with this message. Again, thank you for the story of Jesus in Gethsemane, where we get to see what a healthy, emotional person looks like, where we get to see emotional intelligence at its best. And because of Christ's emotional intelligence, because he was empathetic, and because he was socially aware, and, and because he was super clear about how to self-regulate, because of all these things that we see, and he was clear about his, his motivation, Father, because of all these things, we know the path to victory. So help us, Father, to be more socially intelligent, more socially aware, more emotionally intelligent, more emotionally aware. Help us to be all those things so to your glory, to your honor, we will be able to finish the work you gave us to do. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Let everyone say amen and amen.